Hi, I'm Karen Zupko, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar on website accessibility and the recent tsunami of lawsuits. We've got an outstanding uh, group of speakers today. Uh, Ryan Miller is the founder and CEO of one of the aesthetics in industry's most uh, well-regarded marketing firms, Aetna Interactive. Popular speaker and author, he shares over 20 years of experience uh, with you today in this important topic. Um, Mike Sakopoulos is an attorney. He's the founder of and president of the um, uh, MedRisk Institute. Welcome, Mike. And uh, Dr. Jeff Siegel, who will be our first speaker, is the uh, founder and CEO of Medical Justice. Dr. Siegel is a neurosurgeon by training, as well as an attorney. Um, in the process of developing medical justice, Dr. Siegel has established himself as one of the country's leading authorities on a whole variety of healthcare issues. And Dr. Siegel is also a partner at Bird Adato, a national business and healthcare law firm. So with that, take it away. All right, I think uh, Ryan is going to set the stage shortly, but the reason we're here today is because we have received many phone calls of new defendants, people who auditioned for the role of being a defendant. Nobody wants to be a defendant, but they're on the receiving end in the crosshairs of litigation related to the American as with Disability Act and its state equivalents. Um, the ADA law was implemented decades ago and many, many in healthcare have been caught in the crosshairs, but recently people's websites are being caught in the crosshairs. So I think these are some of the near-term challenges that, uh, that we're dealing with. All right, let's see if we can launch this baby forward. I just wanna point out if you have questions, if you pose those in the little box on the right in your GoToWebinar screen, We'll be, we have allowed plenty of time to answer questions. All right, so the tsunami is here. I cannot tell you the number of phone calls I've received. Ryan has said he's received a number of phone calls. Anybody in the healthcare liability business, Mike, you've received phone calls. We're all receiving phone calls saying, what's going on here? Um, I've had a website for a long period of time. Almost everybody I know can read it, can access it. Many people have tools to be able to dig a little deeper, but for the most part, this looks like a cash crunch or people going after the, um, the physicians for just because they are looking for cash. So we're calling this an epidemic of ADA lawsuits with doctors in the, uh, in the crosshairs. Let's go back down memory lane and let's talk about the ADA Act as it relates to people in healthcare, and there was a Supreme Court case um, over 20 years ago called Bragdon versus Abbott. And here, it had nothing to do with a website, but it was a dentist who got sued, why? He took care of a patient who was HIV positive, and he said, look, I'm concerned, I don't want to put uh, myself or my staff in harm's way, because if something happens uh, uh, to me, if I get stuck with a needle, be a problem. So he said, let's do this not in my office, we'll do this in the hospital. And by the way, I'm not gonna charge you any additional money for the professional fee, but you probably will incur additional charges because we are performing this in the hospital. Well, the patient predictably did not care for this and filed the lawsuit. This went all the way up to the US Supreme Court and what did they determine? They determined that the doctor was unreasonable and did not use objective information to support his conclusion. His point was is that yes, you did indeed um, discriminate against this particular patient because if you use universal precautions, which was recommended at the time by the uh, Center for Disease Control, you really should not be at any increased risk. And by the way, how many of your other patients that you don't test may be HIV positive? And so I think this was not an entirely unreasonable uh, conclusion from the uh, US Supreme Court. Now let's compare and contrast that with Morrow versus Borges Medical Center. 
And this was a, an appellate court case, did not work its way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And it does suggest that there are cases that end up on both sides uh, of, the, uh, of the balance here. So in this particular case, it was an employment law case. Here, a scrub tech, his last name was Morrow, was also HIV positive. And he was terminated because they said that his role um, being in the operating room as an HIV positive uh, individual could place patients in harm's way. So he did admit under deposition that he occasionally did place his hands in the wound. Not surprising, he is, of course, a scrub tech. Um, and he also admitted that uh, occasionally his gloves tore. That's no surprise. Every surgeon's glove, glove will tear at some point down the road. And so the court concluded that if this actually occurred, even if it is uncommon, it could turn into a death sentence for the patient. And so the, the, the appellate court said that this was objective information and the medical center was within its rights to go ahead and let the, um, the employee go. And they were within their rights to do so. So now we go from people in the workplace or patients in an office to websites. And the question is whether websites are considered places of general, accommod general accommodation because this is going to be the buzzword in terms of getting through the door to go ahead and sue someone. You have to determine that a website, um, according to the ADA, would be a place uh, of or in public accommodation. We'll talk about this going forward. Let's see what we got here. So this is a real lawsuit that um, one of our um, clients received recently, and apparently this is a repeat offender. This plaintiff is suing multiple people, alleging somehow they can't get the uh, the information they need from a plastic surgeon website to make an informed decision. What type of information were they looking for? Well, testimonials that may not have had proper closed captions so they could read it. Um, and they not only go after uh, the Americans with Disability Act, but they also um, reference a state uh, act, the UNRWA Civil Rights Act, spelled U-N-R-U-H, and, and many states have an equivalent uh, analogy. So here I've circled the defendant, in this case the plastic surgeon, is a public accommodation within the definition of the title, um, but really they're basically saying the defendant's website is a public accommodation. The defendant's website is a public accommodation. And this is kind of the new stuff. I mean, before it was the office. The office itself didn't have the proper ramps, the proper uh, handles to keep people from falling down, uh, making sure the mirror was the proper distance above the sink and the bathroom and so on and so forth. That stuff has been litigated for decades now, but the, the lawsuit related to websites, that is new material. All right. so. Things that start on the West Coast happen to percolate frequently across the country. What starts in California often works its way across the country. And this is a ADA website case that was in the Ninth Circuit, 2019. Um, and um, so the Ninth Circuit includes California, uh, Oregon, Washington, Hawaii, Alaska, and a few other states and so on and so forth. But here's what they ruled. They ruled that the ADA applies to services of a public accommodation, of a public accommodation, not services in a place of public accommodation. Meaning, if you went into Domino's and somehow they didn't have um, facilities that would accommodate someone with a disability, that would be in a place of public accommodation. But the Ninth Circuit said it's really of a accommodation. You know, it's amazing how one little word can make <laughs> Makes so much of a difference. But anyway, the bottom line was that people were struggling on the website and the app to go ahead and order and pay for pizza, and Domino's knew about the Americans with Disability Act. Accordingly, their website was not compliant. Plaintiff wins. The person who tried to access Domino's website won, uh, won their case. But that is not where the story ends. The story has additional chapters in it. And this is recent news. We go from the West Coast to the East Coast, and this is the 11th Circuit, which includes Georgia and Florida. And they said, we don't agree with California. They said, and somebody was trying to sue Winn-Dixie 
because of their website. And certainly most Winn-Dixies do not look like the picture that I presented on here, <laughs> although many of the cars may actually be the same ones that are out there. But this was a similar case regarding the website. And they said, we actually find uh, the conclusion to be the opposite of what took place in California. We do not believe that um, the website is a place of public accommodation, and it did not create a barrier that people with disabilities um, are still able to use Winn-Dixie's facility, and the defendant, in this case, Winn-Dixie, won. So a completely opposite outcome compared to what happened in California in the Ninth Circuit. So you must be asking yourself, well, where do I live? Do I live in the Ninth Circuit or the Eleventh Circuit? And if I don't live in any of those circuits, what does that mean to me? All right, so I've thrown up the map, and unfortunately, I don't have Hawaii in this map, but Hawaii is in the Ninth Circuit. But the bottom line is there are, um, there are many circuits across the country. The Ninth Circuit has spoken, the Eleventh Circuit has spoken, but every other entity, every other appellate court has not spoken, silent. We don't know whether they're going to lean towards California. We don't know if we're going to lean towards Georgia, what the outcome will be. Uh, and so we'll just have to wait and see. Now, that does not mean that cases are not being filed in any of these geographic regions in the country. In fact, I can guarantee you cases are being filed in these parts of the country. How do I know that? Because Ryan told me. <laughs> Ryan, told me <laughs> Ryan told me he has cases of people in the second appellate. Uh, second and third. Uh, second and third. And there are probably others that when we're done here, you'll pick up the phone call and go, what about me? I, I, I'm on the receiving end. So the bottom line is when you, and this is just a, you know, a legal description, when there's a split in terms of the law between various appellate uh, circuits, that's ripe for going up to the U.S. Supreme Court to adjudicate the the differences and to harmonize the law so everybody can make predictions. I mean, for something as important as this, namely website and accessibility, it would be nice to harmonize the law across the country because they're relying upon a federal law. The Americans with Disability Act is a federal law. So mm -hmm. it would be a good idea, I think, for the Supreme Court to ultimately interpret what the law means as it relates to websites. And with that, let me just pass off the baton uh, to, to Ryan here. Yeah, and it, thanks, Jeff, for that. The the thing I think it's important for everybody to understand coming away from what Jeff just started with is that um, there is not a specific set of legal requirements that you um, are held to today. There is no law explicitly mandating. And in fact, what's opened the doorway for these lawsuits to come to be is this gray area of interpretation where um, uh, plaintiffs and the attorneys that are representing them are um, pointing at businesses and saying, look, we believe that the interpretation is that your website will eventually be found to be um, a place of a, a public accommodation and therefore will be held to the equal access requirements of the ADA's uh, Section 508 Title III. And so we're, we're proactively going after you. Um, some cases, there are some people I think are bad actors. They're just in this for the, the money. But the bigger point is, uh, and I think it's it was really brought to a head during the height of the pandemic, is that we rely more than ever before today on the web and that for individuals that, with disabilities, the web is actually a very hard place to function. And this movement, and I believe it will be a movement that ultimately um, at, a, at a federal level here in the United States, it's actually already uh, federalized in Canada, um, that there will be a movement towards defining the web as a place where businesses need to provide public accommodation. Because um, if you think about it today, you probably pay your bills or your groceries during the pandemic, ordered some significant portion of the, the meals that you ate directly through the internet. And if you weren't able to do that, whether on an app or on the web, um, that would be a really big problem for you or a member of your family. Um, you know, As uh, the gentleman both highlighted here that already, if you're in the United States, you are already at risk. Just a quick nod, we know that we've got some folks from Canada who are joining us on the call today. In Canada, it is uh, province by province, and it is an explicit mandate for compliance against the, the body of code that we'll be talking about, um, although not all of the provinces have yet had their date where their requirements have started. The requirements when they do come up, when a law firm today takes a plaintiff case, they file a suit against you and say, you are not conforming, you're not creating an environment of equal access on your website, what are they checking? Well, explicitly, there is a, um, a set of technical requirements that have been articulated by an independent third-party organization 
uh, called the W3C. It's specifically uh, referred to as the WCAG. To make things super confusing for you, there are multiple versions and multiple levels. The version that has been most often cited in the litigation that we're aware of here in the United States today, it's also the version that is the law of the land uh, in those provinces that have already implemented in Canada, is version 2.0 level AA. This is the technical benchmark that's being used. Now, what's worth noting is back at the end of last year, in October of 2020, federal legislation was proposed that died. It was never passed. That um, established that businesses needed to be substantially conformant, who defines substantial, with this specific body of technical requirements. Now, what's important to understand is that the WCAG 2.0 level AA has 38 separate requirements, and to which you might go, oh, no big deal, 38 things, I can go check 38 things. It's 38 separate requirements on every page, but more explicitly, when we look at any one of the requirements, so this is 1.1.1, it addresses your non-text content, so those might be things like the images on the page, the videos, that you offer. For those of you that are active in, in podcasts, the, the podcast that you publish, your PDF files, those elements are non-text elements of your website. Well, let me show you, let me open up, we have that little blue arrow there. Let me show you what it looks like if we open and expand that to reveal all of the pieces separately that, that constitute conformance with that one requirement. So it's about seven separate requirements inside of this one item. So that 38 items is actually over a hundred separate logical tests that need to be conducted on every page of your website to establish conformance. You know, a really simple one that's on here, uh, many of you are familiar with the idea of CAPTCHA, right? Sometimes it's a strangely presented warped body of text with lines through it or other times you've experienced google captcha where it says uh you know pick all of the images that contain fire hydrants right it's a simple requirement those are graphical elements or non-text and it's the requirement that those captcha the tests that are are implemented before forms can be submitted are um, presented in ways for people who have visual or auditory disabilities, right? So um, it is that granular that these tests need to be run. So as we step back and we say, okay, well, wait a minute, what are the implications for the web? The ADA was passed back in 1998, um, but as Jeff pointed out, it's only just now that we're starting to see litigation, and that's what's bringing attention to this, not an explicit legal requirement. So. Um, there was a test done at the end of last year, and what was found was that the vast majority of sites, 98% of all sites, had at least one WCAG 2.0 failure on just their homepage. You didn't need to go any deeper to run the test. So what do we do, right? So how do we actually get conformant to mitigate the risk? There are two different approaches. They both have um, some significant downsides, so let's talk about both of them. One are what are called accessibility overlays. And for most of you, this is probably gonna be the option that you choose. The second is manual conformance. So um, i would be clear here, we intentionally in our organization, we don't use the word compliance because there is no law against which we can comply. Um, it's the idea of substantially conforming to that WCAG 2.0 level AA checklist. So what is an overlay? We've probably seen one and may not have realized what it was. You'll notice in the lower right corner of the screen, there's the little blue circle with that universal symbol that, uh, for handicap or disability, right? The individual in the wheelchair, we click that, we expose it, and we're presented with a variety of tools, things that might change the contrast on the site, allow us to use a screen reader to have the website read to us, to limit or inhibit flashing, right? For people with, uh, uh, seizure disabilities, flashing or fast movement on a website actually can cause seizures, right? So we've got all these tools that are meant to adapt the site for individuals with different disabilities. There are benefits and there are risks. The benefits are these. They're fairly inexpensive. For sites that are less than a thousand pages, they're less than $500 a year. There's even some free ones out there, although those have problems that I'll highlight in just a second. They're fast to deploy. You can usually get them up on the site in a couple of hours. They do offer some future proofing. The one that I just showed you on the screen actually uses artificial intelligence so that if a member of your team, let's say they publish a blog with a photo in the blog, but they forget to put text behind that image describing, it's called alt text, describing what the image depicts. 
suddenly that single image is now a liability and these overlays use artificial intelligence to look at, analyze the content of the image and to create spontaneously from a computer what they think the image contains as a way to protect you in the future should that uh, liability kind of find its way into your website. Um, some overlays offer various levels of legal support. Um, things like making a video to show all the different ways that you can form that you can use in your defense to providing a time record of when and how different um, accessibility conformance updates were deployed. The risks here is that they don't actually fix. These overlays are a little bit like putting lipstick on a pig. They don't actually change the entity underneath. A website that is not conformant to the requirements will still be non-conformant. And in some cases, and we'll show you in a second, there's some pretty aggressive criticism that they actually make the web harder to use for individuals with disabilities. They do not address all of the accessibility concerns that are out there. And specifically, what they can't do is add closed captions to your videos. They um, can't take a PDF file that contains non-machine readable text. So that's like a scan of a media appearance, right? Let's say you were covered in a newsletter article, a newspaper article or a magazine article, you put it on your scanner and you scan that, that's a picture of text that can't be read by someone who has a disability. And so it's not gonna fix that as well as a couple of other points. In addition to that, and this is one of the ones for us that for us technically slowed our rush to find the right disability overlay or accessibility overlay was that most of them dramatically slow your site performance, especially for mobile users. And you may or may not be aware, but over the next couple of months, Google is preparing to release something called their page experience update, which directly links your search engine rankings to how fast your mobile site performs. And on average, what we found on a 100 point scoring scale, most disability overlays were subtracting 30 points from that score, which is potentially damning for search engine rankings. So the big picture here, let's let's say we, we, we implemented an overlay, does it actually protect me from getting sued? Because most of these suits aren't actually making it to court. As the gentleman can attest, most of them are being settled because it's easier to pay someone off than to pay to litigate um, once, uh, once that case is brought against you. And what the overlays cannot do is they can't stop the suit from being levied in the first place. And in fact, there's quite a bit of evidence that in fact, suits continue to be filed even on sites after overlays are implemented. So we've done a bunch of testing. We grabbed a handful of the most popular overlays. Um, we ran them through for the feature set analysis, how much and how many different disabilities do they cover, and the performance hit, how much do they impact the site speed at the end. We landed on this one. This is a bit of a free recommendation for everybody that's on the call. It's called Accessibi. Um, it does come at a fee. We don't receive any uh, compensation if you choose to use this on your site, but I will share the results of that testing because we believe this is probably gonna be the best option for those that choose overlays. Here's the full disclosure on this. It doesn't matter which one of the major overlays you pick. They are all named by name in at least one major uh, piece of media coverage out there as being a bad thing for the disabled community. Why? It's because it's not actually encouraging businesses to build accessible conformant websites. It's, um, it's taking a shortcut with the hopes of quickly deterring the lawsuits that are coming in, but not fixing the underlying problems. So if you choose to do this path, you set up an account with a service like Accessibility or whichever one you choose, there are others that are free, you install the software on the website, then there's the checklist of all of these different things that you have to fix manually, and your overlay, if it's a free one, they're not gonna tell you what they don't cover. The, <laughs> the services that are out there, that um, come with a fee, provide a secondary checklist to guide you through things that you might wanna check on your own, but they don't certify it. So you've gotta take care of that yourself or trust that you've got a good agency partner that will be diligent in addressing those issues. What do they cost? Well, it's typically less than eight hours. It might be a little bit more if you're someone with hundreds or thousands of videos, lots of media content or a podcast, um, but typically less than eight hours of media time, of agency time rather to um, get it configured, get it installed, and check on all of those things that aren't being covered by the overlay. Um, and they range anywhere from $40 to $140 a month. They're more on very large sites. So if you've got a site that's more than a thousand pages, that's where you're potentially gonna uh, see some higher monthly charges. 
now manual conformance. So in the light of all that, I'm sure you come back and say, well, wait a minute, why don't we just fix these underlying problems that's morally or ethically the right thing to do? And the honest answer is it's the cost, right? It's why in Canada, their legislation actually exempts business with fewer than 50 employees because they've realized it would actually be a um, significant financial burden to do this. So um, the manual approach is an audit, right? I, I highlighted that there's more than 100 separate logical tests that need to be run against each of the pages of your site. Most commonly, it's run against a representative set of pages, anywhere from eight to 20 pages of the site are selected um, that are representative of other similar pages. So for example, maybe you only test one of your photo gallery cases if you're in a aesthetic medicine, but all of your other cases are assumed to be roughly the same. Once that test is done, you prioritize and select which updates are you actually going to be able to afford to do. You decide if you're gonna do an overlay at the same time as insurance for yourself and for your practice. And then you customize and publish this thing called an accessibility statement. Why didn't I mention that accessibility statement up above? Well, because the overlay products that are reputable, like that one I mentioned, Accessibility, they actually include the development of the accessibility statement for you, where if you're doing the manual approach, you've got to do it yourself. Then you've got to cross-train every person who contributes to your website to ensure that they understand what needs to be done differently as you go into the future so that you don't accidentally introduce a single element that essentially creates again the liability for you and makes your site non-conformant because of that one change. What does that manual effort cost? The audit alone, just the process of having an expert body come in and look at your website, assess what it would take to get you to the place of conformance is typically a 10 to $14,000 effort. For that, some will actually certify you at the end of a multi-stage process. Then you've got to go through and do the code and content enhancements on your site those can be equal or greater than the actual assessment costs. So you're probably looking at a, a minimal effort, a minimal cost for the effort to conform that's closer to $20,000. In some cases, more expensive than, expensive than your original website development cost. Now, maintenance and social media are also considerations, so I want to touch, touch on both topics briefly. The um, accessibility effort, the thing that you have to understand is it's not a one and done. In many cases, I would say it's probably fair to think of it like the recertification or the maintenance of certification for your operating center, right? You have a big moment in time where you get everything certified, you prepare the binders, you train the staff. You then have that ongoing responsibility to maintain compliance so that you don't have complaints brought against you during your course of operations, and then you have to recertify at some point down the road. How could something like this happen? A single moment in time undo everything? Let's run through a quick hypothetical. Let's say that you have videos that you've produced and you've adopted the practice of first publishing all of your videos to YouTube and you've enabled on your YouTube channel automated closed captioning. Okay, so YouTube has this service where um, it's a setting on your channel, you turn it on, and it automatically adds that closed captioning text for you. You don't even need to take the time to do it yourself. And then your protocol is you embed the video from YouTube onto your website, and that ensures that it has the closed caption. There's a problem. About one in every 80 videos that you upload to YouTube, for some unexplained reason, just won't get the closed captioning, even if it's turned on on your channel. But your protocol doesn't call to wait before publishing to check to make sure those closed captioning appear. You add it to your website and boom, just like that, there's a video without closed captioning and that's enough to precipitate a lawsuit. That's the risk that we're facing inside this environment. Now, where are you most likely to get sued? And we've seen a variety of webs, uh, uh, website accessibility lawsuits from both coasts. I'm only aware of one in the middle of the country that I've heard about so far. Um, and they are largely focused on these areas. Websites that, for the way that they were developed, um, limit the ability of the user to use the tab or keyboard to navigate the, the pages of that website, right? So this would be for someone who relies on keyboard controls because they can't readily operate a mouse, relies on keyboard controls to move through your site. If they can't get to your pages, it's seen as being inaccessible. If they can't understand the content of your images. Now, I mentioned before what alt text is. It's a abbreviation for alternative text for people who are visually impaired and it's text that is read out loud by the software as it moves through the body of a page. Similar 
uh, like closed captions on video content or full transcripts associated to things like audio files and podcasts need to be offered. Now, the last of these um, areas where we see major risk, and I'm aware of at least two lawsuits where I've seen this uh, referenced, are PDFs that contain non-machine readable text. And the example I gave you earlier was that you were covered in a magazine, you set it on the bed of the scanner in the office, you took that scan, but you didn't use uh, what's called OCR, or object character recognition, to create a transcript. You published it on a media page, someone can click and open it, um, and it's visually available, but it's not available to the visually impaired. And on pages like that, we actually need to offer a full text transcript on a page below where we link to that PDF, right? So these are the kinds of things that are most likely to get you and your clinic in trouble. Now we get questions all the time, well, what about social media? And, and I don't think, Jeff or Mike, I don't think you've seen this yet. I am not aware of any lawsuits there. I would say this is a low risk, but we'll take a moment since we're on the line, just before we wrap up to just touch on this point. Um, if you think about it, what they're concerned with largely is equal access. And if you publish an image or a video, and the good news is, is that Facebook and Instagram, they're owned by the same company. They automatically close caption videos that you publish there. You publish a video, they want equal access. We've got that covered. But if you publish an image, there's no part of the service where you actually can do the equivalent of alt text on either platform today. I suspect this will probably change. And so we need to ensure that any image that goes onto a social media platform like Instagram has text with it that would allow me to gain essentially the substantially the uh, same content or same experience that's contained in that image. And that might uh, influence or change how you post on social media. And if you're using newer novel platforms, there are new platforms in social media that, that emerge at least twice a year. Um, make sure that any video that you're posting there uh, is automatically being closed captions to limit your liability now and into the future. And if you are sharing files or linking to files through social media, be sure that those files contain text that's machine readable. Machine readable, the way to, to know that is you can place your cursor and click. If you can highlight individual letters in words, the screen reader or the software reader will pick that up. If you can't, it means it's a picture of text and that's a problem. So what now, what do we do? You have a choice to make, right? You've got that, that high road or low road. Do you want accessibility conformance that's driven through the overlay, a little bit of a shortcut, some specific risks or pitfalls that come with it, or do you want to go the route of manual conformance? Either way, it's a conversation that you need to be having with your agency partner, and you probably need to be having it right away because these lawsuits are only accelerating, they're not diminishing. What we see as a, uh, a comfortable third option for those that choose the manual conformance path, because that will take time, is you might want to choose to combine the two approaches if your end goal is ultimately to be manually conformant. Now, what if in the interim you happen to get a letter? Now, the first thing you need to do is assess applicability. We've seen at least one letter in which the specific assertion was just wrong, and it was a simple matter of having the technical team advise the legal team so they could respond back and say, hey, there's no basis for this, uh, you're wrong in your assessment. Um, in the event that that's not the case, you need to seek help. So uh, and I think maybe Mike and Jeff, when I wrap up here, it'd be good for you guys to talk about the connection to a conversation with your insurance uh, agency, but bring in your legal team, bring in your agency or technical team and share with them the copy of the letter because they, we will need to see that exact text because there is always an explicit assertion. And your conversation should be both about how do we fix this immediate uh, issue that's raised by the plaintiff? And then once we've addressed the crisis, let's mitigate the risk. What other risk factors are out there? Let's go back and have that conversation about conformance in an approach. Um, your attorney is probably going to acknowledge the letter so that the, the, the plaintiff's team understands what you're doing. You're gonna execute some kind of remedy and communicate that back. Um, and you know, just, um, you know, I would say as a final thought here, the reason why we're in the position we're in is because we're in a, a kind of legal gray zone where the ADA says, uh, it talks about the idea of public accommodation and we have varying circuit courts that have different opinions about whether or not your website is a place of public accommodation. And we have plaintiff's attorney who are using the gray zone, the lack of a, a clear federal guideline about whether or not who needs to comply and to what level, they're using that gray zone as a vehicle to open lawsuits and in many cases achieve settlements. 
even though the broader goal, I believe, is really about creating a web that's more accessible for everyone. So on that, um, maybe Mike or Jeff, do you want to talk a little bit about the intersection? Should they receive a letter with insurance? And then Karen, let's let's hand that back to you for any Q&A. Yeah, sure, I'd like to ask Mike. Just a second. I'd like to, excuse me, I want to encourage people to please post your questions. I can't believe that some of you are like me, not like me, scratching my head, wondering well, who could post. And a whole series of things are racing through my mind. Let's hear your questions. Please post in that question box. I want to I want to first start by throwing a question to Mike because um, there are there are two forks in the road. You either get a demand letter from an attorney or you get a lawsuit from an attorney or from the courts, but ultimately the plaintiff attorney has popped it forward. Those are two different dimensions, and you've certainly seen similar types of actions with things like copyright or privacy violations, where there are so many gray zones and I remember um, a number of our clients getting um, a demand letter from a plaintiff saying, hey, look, you stole the images from our website, et cetera. Give us $5,000 or $50,000. Now, those are two entirely different paths that you, you would think about. 5,000 is painful, but not as painful as 50,000. And then I'd like you to talk about insurance potentially as a mechanism for assisting here. That's something that everybody should know about. So I think where you're headed with the 5,000 and 50,000 is folks may have to make a business decision. Even, well, I'll address insurance here in a moment, but you're going to have some form of a deductible. And perhaps the least expensive thing to do is to hold your nose and um, cross your fingers and write a check for a small amount of money. I don't like to encourage that. That falls in my mind in the category of negotiating with terrorists. But sometimes that is the least expensive, both financially and time-wise, to get rid of a problem. Doesn't mean that the problem won't come back again, right? So ultimately, I think that you're going to have to address if you do have website issues um, with a, a firm much like uh, Ryan's that does exceptional work to be able to help you get in um, <clears throat> get your, your site in a little bit uh, better shape. Now, <clears throat> there you do have some potential of getting insurance through your normal policies. Depends on what you have. This, as everyone has said, is a gray zone. So policies have not traditionally been written directly on point on this. If you were to look at your general liability policy, it has some degree of coverage for media and advertising. It's generally geared towards misuse of copyrighted material, but oftentimes that language is a little bit loose. It hasn't come up before, and arguments can be made that that coverage should extend to a claim on the Americans with Disability Act that your practice is facing. There are other areas of insurance that are more likely to, to cover it, EPLI, employment uh, type of uh, coverage, also provides some coverage for this situation, as does directors and officers coverage under some. All of this is language dependent upon the type of policies that you have. Again, we've not seen until recently a wave of these, and insurance companies are slow to react and to alter the language of policies to address specific types of new, new risks. So I think in the coming months and years, we're going to see some clarification from the insurance industry. But right now, it is worth checking. You are looking for third-party coverage for these type of, of claims. And this is something that you could check with your broker to see if the policies and the coverage you have in place uh, would, would address these type of claims. A call to your broker shouldn't cost you anything, and at least you would know if you're covered in the event that you draw a letter or a lawsuit. And Mike, if I can add on there, one of the things that I, I think clinics need to be cautious of is I'm aware of at least one clinic that um, received a, a formal suit uh, as opposed to a demand letter, um, settled, and then as soon as that check cleared, the exact same uh, attorney with a different plaintiff filed a second suit um, for a different issue. The, the client, they had not uh, become fully conformant. 
um, and within literally within days of the check clearing. So um, your reference to terrorism, I think it, it's a real risk, it's a real threat. And unfortunately, this is one of those things that, that as business owners, we all need to be taking really seriously. It it makes the um, the legal profession so endearing to everyone, doesn't it, Ryan? <laughs> when you ha have these kind of things. So there are ethical rules that prevent lawyers from agreeing not to bring claims for other clients in the future. So you, if you think, well, I'll settle it and I'll make part of the deal is they can never sue me again. My guess is you're going to see someone uh, wave that and try to hide behind it. And you're absolutely right. You may be encouraging a whole flotilla of claims to come uh, by writing a, a small check to start with, um, only to find out that you have a whole series of other checks to write thereafter. So um that's part of the, that needs to be part of your your calculus and ultimately if you're exposed you're you're going to need to do some work on your website to reduce that exposure i don't I, and i don't think anybody on this panel would encourage just the um write the check and hope for the best strategy of life we can't do that yeah it's and but from the the survey i would say everyone on this call today is exposed um, you know, unfortunately, I've, I'm aware of other agencies that have for several months been, been telling clinics that, hey, all you need to do to comply is to install this free uh, overlay without the secondary conversation about all of the other things that need to be manually adjusted with the overlay. And every one of the clinics I've talked to in that, um, uh, in that instance, when we look at their site for them, we can easily pick out uh, additional areas of non-conformance, even though they've deployed the overlay. So, it, you know, I would argue that probably, you know, that 98 or 100 percent of the individuals who are joining us for this are, in fact, uh, in, a, in a position of risk today. Well, we've got a very rich question that I think needs to be posed because I suspect this asker has a whole group of uh, other people wondering the same thing. Sure. It sounds like this. Why is this an issue for plastic surgery sites? The sites are for marketing information and at the end of the day for the promotion of the practice. They are not essential, not required. No one has to use it. It's not like it's a public utility serving the public. Um, going to the website isn't a requirement to becoming a patient. I assume the legislation applies to all, but it seems absurd. Uh, yeah. Yeah, let me, let me just take a first stab and then Ryan. You know something? Okay. I thought that that was going to be good oh, wrong for you. We'll guys. all have something to say. It's like um, it's like a red cape to a bull in in a uh, <laughs> in a matador. So yes, do do we think every aspect of the law is appropriate? No, we do not. And the general contact uh, context is that if you don't like how the law is implemented. We have to change the law, or at least have the law interpreted by judges who see things differently. Um, I, I think a straight face argument can be made that um, even in an aesthetic surgeon's practice that the website is providing some information. And the question is, is it, uh, is it information that um, somebody would use to make an informed decision as to which doctor to see? So if there are 10 different doctors to see, um, it would be helpful to know, is, is this practice going to be helpful to me as someone who is disabled so that I can navigate through their physical structure, uh, both um, without any problems as well as um, feel at home and welcome. But also it's to help them make an informed decision. That is indeed the argument that's being made. The, the argument that's being made legally is that the website is an appendage of the business. And that it's true, nobody needs to market, but if you don't market, you will have no business unless you're the only game in town. Ryan, pick pick up uh, from there. Yeah, so the first thing I was, I'm gonna counter that and say, it's it's not just plastic surgery. The first suit I ever heard of back in 2020 was actually for a dermatology practice. And then very, very shortly thereafter in late 2020, um, the second one that I became aware of was for an orthopedic office followed by an ophthalmology clinic. So, um, it wasn't actually until early this year that I started to see that movement towards plastic surgery, number one. Um, number two, as we think about it, the fact is for some clinics, I think that's true. It is just a, a marketing platform, although I would argue that that same doctor, if called in front of a state medical licensing board or a society, um, would argue that it's actually about patient education, and that's that's 
their main motivator in most cases is, is as a vehicle to educate patients who are considering both them and their procedures. Um, and I would go a little further and say, well, today, uh, much information coming out of the clinic. So for clinics that do priced-based promotions, specials, many times the only place you can learn about them today is actually on the website. So that is uh, a feature or uh, clinics use bill pay that's routed through the websites. Many clinics have patient portals that are an integral part of how patients interact with the patient today. All of those things are um, things that are, I would say, an integral part of how the patient interacts with and gains information from the business. But more broadly, why is medicine and elective medicine being targeted? Well, um, in that uh, ADA Section 508 Title III, there are specific areas that are defined for this, this type of public accommodation or equal access, and medicine is listed explicitly in there. So um, because of the fact that medicine is seen as um, something that directly relates to our, our health and our happiness, it often, uh, from a legislative standpoint, is um, named explicitly, and this happens to be one of those cases. So I would argue it's not so much of a target on plastic surgery. In fact, plastic surgeons are um, sort of late to the hunt uh, in terms of uh, um, being shot at, but um, more explicitly, healthcare is directly being targeted. Um, plastic surgeons are probably right now looks like easy prey because of the perception of deeper pockets. Oh yeah, it's uh, Willie Sutton is the person that we referenced, they asked Willie Sutton why he robbed banks. He said, answer simple because that's where the money, the money is. is. So a lot of this is a, a, a ploy to get cash. Um, I can't tell you that it doesn't just happen on websites. It also happens in businesses. In fact, in Georgia, as an example, they had what were called testers, people that had real disabilities would go into convenience stores asked to use the bathroom. They, they never intended to, nor did they purchase anything from the convenience store, but they would take their ruler out, measure was the mirror the appropriate distance above the sink, and so on and so forth. And for many of these convenience stores that have no background training experience in this, they were not in compliance or they didn't conform uh, to the law using the proper terminology. And so they got, they got hit with litigation. It was one of these, hey, pay us now a modest amount pay us 2,500 bucks, we'll go away, you don't have to litigate this. And many people rolled over, and in fact, you'd find the exact same plaintiff, the same person with a disability, the same tester, going from convenience store to convenience store, making a pretty good living. This was indeed their day job. In fact, we wrote about um, one practice out in, uh, I think it was uh, in Nevada or Arizona, but I didn't know whether this patient was a test or not. It was an individual. Well, anyway, the practice was performing some type of cosmetic procedure related to, um, I guess it was penile enlargement. And um, this patient came in with cerebral palsy, barely able to uh, move his uh, arms, um, also had a background history of hypertension and a and seizure disorder, had epilepsy, poorly controlled with medication, came in to have the procedure performed. And as they were kind of thinking through this, they gave him the informed consent form to sign. He couldn't, couldn't even sign it. He lived alone. So the question was, how is this individual going to be able to even manage or take care of himself mm -hmm. postoperatively? And from my perspective, I don't, I mean, I don't know enough about the procedure that's being performed, but I would just say it's probably not a great surgical risk if you can't actually take care of yourself postoperatively. But my concern, um, which was no less important, was that he may have been a tester, you know, with significant disability, saying that a procedure was denied to him precisely because he was disabled. So it's not just websites that are out there that uh, cause a tsunami of ADA litigation. Thanks, Jeff. I've got a couple other questions that we want to go for zippier answers here, guys. I have a client. This is from a fellow attorney. I have a client who was sued without warning a letter because two of 150 videos on YouTube were not closed captioned, yep. like Ryan stated. The videos were not on the website. Is there a way to review YouTube channels to assure that all videos are closed captioned without going through them manually? No. 
So <laughs> I, I only know because I had to write the protocol for my team to do this about a month ago. Um, it, there are tools inside of YouTube, uh, your channel's analytics to export all the links to all of the video content, but then you still have to open each one manually, look to see that there is a CC inside of a little white uh, pill-shaped icon, a CC icon present on the video to know that the captioning worked. Google does not today, it's a free automated service. Um, I don't think they anticipated that it was going to provide the organization that was intended to provide legal protections. So they haven't provided any kind of utility to say, yes, I was successful. You now have closed captions there. Um, that reporting is not available. It may be available at some point in the near future, but it's not there today. It's a manual review. Great question. Okay, this is a, another great question. Hey, are webinars like this required to be accessible with captions? Uh, the short answer is yes. So on our side, we actually use a third-party transcription service um, in addition to closed captioning on YouTube when we do our webinar content. So we present both the closed captioning and a text transcript specifically to provide the coverage. Okay. Um, the, the comment was, ouch, I was afraid of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, one other question is, who should be allowed to post on uh, your social media or your website. My experience is, and you know, I wonder about yours, that sometimes it's a part-time employee, sometimes we're encouraging all the nurses, oh, please, you know, post, uh, you had permission and you're gonna post this on our social media and on yours. So can we talk a little bit about permissions or authority or control on posting? Do we have another hour? Um, so, I, gentlemen, you guys can chime in on this. I would say today, because I'm not aware of any litigation on social media related to ADA, the, your bigger risk is actually related to HIPAA and patient privacy, making sure that you have informed, you have not informed consent, that you have consent forms for the use of their their likeness, whether it's in video or photo. I'm a, I'm aware of lots and lots of settlements and suits that relate to uh, staff members who grabbed a photo. They didn't get the consent form, they published it to social media, and then a big brouhaha ensued. Um, and so I would say, yes, you need to be selective. Yes, you need to train. This is one more layer to add to that training, um, but certainly okay. the bigger consideration is you know, state medical marketing uh, laws, business and professions code, avoiding false, fraudulent, misleading statements in your advertising, and ensuring that you get patient permission. Uh, Jeff and Mike, what else would you add on that? Well, Mike, I'd like to toss this one to Mike because I think it's part of the HIPAA compliant training that he's been providing to quite a few plastic surgery practices here around Chicago. So one of the things that I'm seeing is that sometimes estheticians have their own uh, channels or, or doing things on, on their own in addition to what the practice is. And so oftentimes the consent to use an image runs to the practice, but not to the individual employee of the practice. And there you have a problem knowing that it's going on through your practice and you're allowing this kind of a dual or duality of, of use of, of images. Besides the fact that it is creating a nice body for the esthetician to then declare free agency status and move on down the street, costing you um, lot, lots of money. So it's yeah, multiple reasons why you want to be very careful when it comes to this. And I know we're a little bit uh, far afield of, of ADA, but I thought uh, it's another risk that people should know about when we're talking on this topic. If, I, if we did the image on our site or our, our social media and we followed all the rules and we have the little cc but when nancy posts it on her site the c does the cc transfer or ryan when it's repurposed reposted must i go through those steps i think this is a big point based on yeah. all the conversation that i heard at the aesthetic society meeting as an yeah, example uh, i want to stress again i'm not aware of any ada lawsuits being brought against anyone for social media posting activity yet so in terms of the evidence for me to be as a business owner concerned or um focused on mitigating the risk there uh, there's not a lot of evidence in that space so i would I would lower the perceived threat level okay. um, and still say, you know, the broader question here is one about how do I take a, a social media star inside my office and provide guidance for 
um, thoughtful and regulated participation on social media on behalf of this, this business, the advice that we give all of our clients is that all of the posts need to first go through the practices own social media channels following your documentation for how that's going to be handled. So what kind of claims are permissible? Um, are there consents on file? Once that's done, your esthetician, your nurse injector, that person is free to then repost, but they are not permitted to, to do first party posts on their personal social media because it has direct and immediate bearing on the, the medical licensure of the medical director. And I'm not a lawyer, guys. I, I realize I just started talking like one there for a second, so correct me if that's wrong. But this is the way that we guard, guide our clients. It provides uh, um, the assurance as well that all of those posts carry the branding at the clinic and can actually support the growth of the brand overall. Jeff or Mike, did I say anything that was leading? No, you did. Well, welcome, welcome to the clan. You're now, you're now one of us. You'll be I'm equally lawyer, disliked because you're a lawyer. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, just getting back to the question of who should be posting, I think Mike is exactly correct also that HIPAA privacy issues are where you can and will get burned. And because it is so mission critical, I think it's probably a good idea not just to appoint one individual, but two people should lay eyes on something that's so mission critical, making sure all the proper authorizations are obtained and that nothing untoward goes up that could violate privacy. Um, when I say Mission critical, I think of it like aviation. I mean, virtually every commercial plane that goes up has a pilot and co-pilot. It really keeps the fatality yeah. rate going down. So yes, I would say two people have to lay eyes on it to check off. Okay, got, got another one. Oops, Mike? I, I just wanted to get Ryan's opinion on a, a hybrid approach to overlay and manual um, when it comes to these requirements of uh, patient portals, you briefly touched upon it, but now we're seeing open note requirements and the Cures Act is talking about information blocking. It seems to me that there are certain portions of websites that are far more critical to be ADA com compliant uh, than, than perhaps others. And maybe you could disagree with me on that or, or talk about that. Yeah, so I would say the reason why most clinics are concerned about it today um, I, you know, isn't because they believe they have a moral or ethical obligation to build a more accessible site. It's they're, they're trying to avoid suit. And what we know today is a single video without captions, a single photo without alt or alternative text is enough for lawsuits. So in, in terms of prioritizing one area of the site over the other, um, you know, most of our clients, the messaging is, what do I need to do to not be sued first? And um, the fastest thing to be done is always going to be that overlay with the few manual, small number of manual fixes that aren't covered by the overlay. Um, and even for practices that feel whether for um, moral, ethical, or, or business practical reasons that they want to pursue full manual compliance, um, that's going to take several weeks or months to execute. And that gives you the coverage in the interim. Um, one uh, question that has come up here says, what about Facebook Live? Do I need captions? if I'm doing Facebook Live? I think that's a good question, thank you. Yeah, so my understanding is that the, the live platform, and I apologize because I'll need to go and research this answer afterwards, but my belief based on my reading, I actually haven't tested it personally where I've tested all of the other feature set, is that it, it is captioning you in real time when you're live. Um, the, the trick that people need to understand on both the Facebook and Instagram platforms, enabling the display of closed captions is a deep, uh, buried setting, you have to go through like three or four mouse clicks to get there, but you can turn it on to test it yourself. Um, if you uh, seek okay. out that setting, it's in it's in your settings on, on both uh, the app and on the web-based versions, uh, turn that on and you'll be able to actually see the evidence that it's there uh, so that you can assure yourself that it's happening. Okay, another question that's come in, um, do you recommend an accessibility statement on websites? And if so, what should it what should it include? Yeah, so the W3C includes, uh, they offer a template. So search the, the letter W, the number three, the letter C, accessibility statement. They actually offer a statement generator. It's a template. They'll prompt you for um, answering the questions. A part of those questions are quite technical because uh, the statement declares how far and into what, uh, what version and which level of accessibility you are um, a, you are conformant, and you may not be able to, to determine that on your own. So you'll, you'll need to partner with your, your agency in order to fill out that center section of it. Um, if you're choosing an accessibility overlay like the one that I recommended, again, we have no financial interest in accessibility. We just evaluated it and it scored best in our testing. Um, 
they will deploy a statement as a part of the their plugin. It's inside the plugin. If you're doing a manual conformance test, you can use the template generator to help you create that. What is it doing though? What the statement is doing is it's declaring both to disabled individuals, but more to the, the attorneys that are representing them, we are making a concerted effort to be substantially conformant. Here is what we have done. And if you are having a problem, what do you need to do to alert us so we can help you? Right? And so that component of, a, of it alone, I think, uh, you know, Mike or Jeff, if I stood in front of a, a legal office and said, I had made substantial efforts, I right. had a clear path, this plaintiff did not choose to exercise that path and alert me, um, I think it, it helps in mounting that defense and avoiding the need to settle. Particularly in federal court, when and many of these cases go to federal court, federal judges will rely very much upon your intent. Were you doing a good job to try and solve a problem? The answer is yes, and the other person or the plaintiff is basically saying, I don't want your help, I'm just looking for the money. I think yeah. I think the judge will rule in your favor, actually, or at least lean in your favor. Yeah, we talked a little bit about that at yesterday amongst ourselves, so I'm glad that question came up because I think demonstrating a, a positive uh, intention to be helpful is important. Here's another good question. If I were to have a new, all capital letters, website designed, how do I guarantee the website designer complies with these ADA requirements? Should this be explicitly stated in the contract for building the new site. Yeah, so a couple things, if we go back and we look at the data point that I shared earlier, that 98% of the sites on the web, just their homepage alone is non-compliant today. This is a whole new approach to coding that's not very common outside of the public sector. The public sector has had more focus on this for a long time. It's why their sites tend to be much more uh, boring because they are rigidly using, they're using these rigid templates that are already pre-tested as being conformant. So the long and the short of it is you can have that conversation with your agency and say, I want to make sure this is a part of my project. Expect the cost of your project to roughly double. Um, and in order to get any kind of guarantee, I know for our agency, because we don't offer the conformance testing um, internally as our own delivered service, we rely on a third party tester to actually get that guarantee. There would likely need to be an additional service that's embedded in which a third party is engaged to provide that conformance assurance at the end. Um, it is very much an iterative process where you design, develop, and then you have to test. So there are new steps, there's new labor and new approaches to development that are gonna be required for that full conformance. You, the question comes up, well, if we know that these suits are happening, why isn't everybody moving this way? And the answer right. is, which way? As an agency owner, a problem what I struggle with my team is that the difference between 2.0 level AA, 2.0 level AAA, 2.1 A, 2.1 AA are dramatically different. Uh, a, a full doubling of effort if we go from 2.1 AA to, or excuse me, 2.0 AA to 2.1 AA. And so because there's no law defining, at least in the United States, what conformance looks like and whether we must hit full conformance or simply demonstrate a substantial conformant good faith effort, I don't know how to design the process today. And what we're doing in partnership with our clients are more focusing on the retrofit to say, once the site is built, what do we need to do to provide the adequate level of protection and demonstrate that good faith effort until we have an explicit law telling us all, this is how to do it and this is your checklist. Well, it seems to me as though we still have 129 folks uh, who are with us, that we should all be writing our respective specialty societies and that medicine should go forward to ask for this level of clarity because this is all a little bit crazy making. Yeah. Uh, let's. This will be our last question um, and we will go through the written questions that were not answered. This uh, gentleman or woman wants to know, will there be a live recording provided to participants for today's webinar? And I believe we agreed that the uh, recording would live on all of our individual websites and you see those posted. So you can go to any one, any one of the participants and you'll find that information there. Yeah, I want typically, to Karen, you. we see about a 72 hour delay for posting, depending on whose sites it's gonna go on. Oh. And for us, it's, it's because we, we do the, the transcription of it. Okay. <laughs> all right, right there, we have another example. So it will be 72 hours. 
Well, I want to take this opportunity to thank you all for joining us. Food for thought. And please do write your specialty society. Get them on the case. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Karen. Thank you.